Good morning and a very warm welcome to this webinar on UK and global mar grain markets and what they mean for your business. My name is Rachel Brooks, I am the Rural Advisor for CLA East and it is my pleasure to be chairing this event. Our speaker today is Sebastian Millet, a former trader now CEO of ODA, an independent grain marketing consultancy. Sebastian will be covering his current views on the market, how the global and UK markets compare, and how you can make the most of the current market volatility. There will be an opportunity to ask questions during and at the end of the webinar, so please use the Q&A function of Zoom to pose any questions you may have. You may have already spotted the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. I should also remind you that today's session is being recorded for those delegates that want to watch on demand. Without further ado, Sebastian, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And thank you to, to uh, CLA to invite us to this uh, webinar. And hello, <coughs> hello and welcome everybody, all farmers who are listening to us today. So um, I'm going to very quickly present uh, ODA and myself. So I would start with myself. So yes, I'm, I'm the CEO of ODA now. Uh, I've, had, I've been working in the grain business for nearly 25 years now. Uh, I've worked uh, as, a, as a trader for Dreyfus and Cargill in Argentina, Brazil, uh, and Europe, uh, trading grain and, and all seeds. And for the last more or less 15, 15 years, I've been working on the farming side, uh, starting first uh, uh, by managing the, the risk, uh, the price risk and the logistics for big agro holdings in Ukraine and in Argentina. And now I'm fully dedicated to uh, uh, try to, to give all or to transfer all this knowledge to uh, European farmers. So I'm now the ODA of uh, ODA. So ODA is, is uh, originally a French uh, a company created at the end of the 90s when uh, prices became volatile again, when the European Union stopped uh, uh, controlling the prices. And it was created really to, to first of all, to train farmers to understand uh, how world markets uh, uh, impacts their ex-farm prices. So a lot of training. We've trained about 15,000 farmers around Europe for the last 22 years. Um, we also provide information, independent information, and we, um, and we uh, provide advice to help uh, um, farmers to take uh, informed decision and timely decision when selling uh, their grains. So today we are now based in the UK, but with some clients uh, all over Europe, which is for us uh, very important. As I wrote here on the top, we are we consider ourselves as a community of community of farmers because we we do provide a lot of uh, information and market stories to the to, to to our clients, our farmers. But we also, of course, interact very much with farmers because uh, the information about yields, about qualities, about weather, etc. That you that our clients uh, uh, bring to us is also highly important because thanks to this, I would say, uh, very strong expertise we have in Europe, it allows us to also exchange information with our colleagues in Brazil, in the US, in Argentina, in Russia, etc., etc., which makes uh, 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 the, inform the, the a network of information which is, of course, very valuable, especially to be able to value the the um, the, the, the supply side of, of, of our markets. So we are based in the UK with some, uh, uh, we cover most of the, of the arable, I would say, uh, uh, sector. We, we, we train farmers, we, we do uh, also send weekly and daily information, uh, very spotted uh, uh, on, uh, uh, I would say, market influencers, and we try the way we work is we try, like we will do today, is really to tell a, a market story. I mean, we are very conscious that farmers, uh, first of all, have very little time to spend on that. Uh, you have a lot of expertise on many domains to, to, to run and manage your farms. So what we try to do is, of course, save you time and try to make the, the very complex market story as simple as possible to, to understand. Um, and, and, and of course, this is uh, on the right, we also provide advice. So each time we, we, we decide to, 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 the time is good for selling or for hedging your prices, all our clients receive 
uh, uh, what we call a flash, which allows them to act uh, accordingly. So I've added this slide because if you have, uh, after this, this, this webinar, any questions on our services, on the market, etc., please do not hesitate to take a, 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 a screenshot of, of, of my contacts. Do not hesitate to contact me, or otherwise you can use ODA Connect, which is our uh, website. So let's move now to, to the market presentation. So it has been, as you know, a, as you know, a very volatile and, and very rich, I would say, uh, year for, for, for our markets. Uh, um, and and there, there is a lot to say. We will try to make it as short and as simple as possible. So we'll start focusing on where the prices stand, because looking at prices, looking at graphs already tells us a lot of stories. Uh, we will then focus on, on, uh, on the UK market, but very, very, uh, I would say, shortly, because it's absolutely not the UK market that is making the prices at the moment uh, because of the big world uh, uh, volatility. Um, then we will focus on stocks because stocks is the real market story at the moment. Stocks are very low, so we'll take a look at that. Then we'll focus on the demand, particularly, particularly sorry, on the Chinese demand, which has been a major uh, uh, price uh, changer this year. And uh, then we will see all uh, the crops, the, the new crop supplies risk we have at the moment with major weather uh, risk and, and, and impact, uh, especially in the US and in South America that are taking place at the moment. And we will conclude with, with uh, the, the price influencers and what to watch for, for the coming, in the coming uh, months. So let's start with uh, a first graph, um, and uh, here in this presentation, you will see that I will speak a lot about corn, simply because corn is uh, um, the, 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 the price leader, I would say, uh, in our market. So everything that impacts corn will impact uh, your ex-farm wheat uh, prices. So corn is, uh, is really the, 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 the crop to look, look for and to watch for, uh, for the grain markets. And soya beans, I will speak a lot about soya beans too, is really what uh, to watch for, for the old seed rape uh, market. So these graphs, I think it's very interesting. It's uh, the last 20 years uh, corn prices uh, uh, in, in, in Chicago. And what it tells you, it tells you that you have cycles of volatility hist uh, historically. So we've had a cycle of very low volatility for about seven years uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, followed by a cycle of seven years of very high volatility, followed by another seven years of low volatility. And we seem to be entering quite, quite logically in a new phases of high volatility. So the good news is when you have high volatility, it's very illustrated here that you have nice, much nicer price opportunities. So that's a very, I mean, the, the coming years normally should bring you much higher prices than what you've had uh, in the past uh, seven years. So one, uh, I would say that the price range would be 150 to 200 on, uh, in, in the UK, accordingly. Um, what also is important to note is when we have, so at the moment we have a very strong volatility and very bullish market, but looking at the past, once again, to always, always looking at the past to predict the future, it's very easy to see that prices never stay very long uh, uh, at, at, uh, at, at this kind of levels. So two things here to conclude. First of all, we, uh, we should have volatile and higher prices for the coming years, not only for the coming weeks, but be careful to, to really sell at the right timing and don't hesitate to sell even when the prices are going up because they can fall very quickly. Um, and, and we will now move forward to try to understand what's going on now. So this is a similar graph, but showing corn, wheat, and soya beans prices. So here again, it's very illustrative that it is the corn and the soya that, are, that have led to the very high current prices. And wheat, graphically, is very illustrative too, is only a follower. Wheat by itself, the SND, the supply and demand, is very comfortable. And without the corn issue we are having, corn stocks issue and the soybean stocks issue we have, the wheat prices would be much lower than where we are now. The other thing to understand is if 
when prices go so strongly up and reach this kind of levels, it's absolutely not a natural level for corn, for service, for wheat, etc. The market climbs there only to ration the demand. Okay, if there is a stock problem, uh, not enough supply to feed the market, to, to, to feed the market, so the market climbs to ration the demand. Once it has considered that the demand has been sufficiently rationed, the market very quickly anticipates and look to uh, for, for, for the other crop. So the other crop is the, the south, southern hemisphere. So that's in September. We will already be uh, drilling a big, big, certainly very large crops in South America. So even if we have a stock problem, the market starts to anticipate. And if we look at, at, at past history, you see that once we've reached these rationing levels, markets very quickly uh, 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 consolidate. So it's quite likely, uh, unless we have a major uh, weather event again in the US, it's quite likely that the market will not stay very long where they stand now. So here, sorry, on the next slide, I've zoomed on this part because it looks like a straight line, but in, in fact, it's not a straight line at all. So here again, it's uh, the corn market we are focusing on. And this is the last four months. <laughs> and as you can see, the volatility is great because these four months change it, uh, market change uh, correspond to $70 per ton, which is absolutely, absolutely huge. And for the last four months, we've, we've had a great volatility driven mainly by weather markets. Okay, so starting in March, what we know for, as a fact is we are ending uh, the season of 2020-21 with very low stock levels for corn and soya. Very, very low historical stocks. So what the market is now trying to do I'm talking about the new crop, and on this presentation, I will only speak about the new crop. The market is trying to assess if the stocks are going to be replenished next year, or if they're going to remain very low, or if they are even going to be lower. And the market will react according, according to this anticipation. So in March, uh, the market considered and had great expectation for US farmers to drill a huge area of corn and soya which has led, if you remember well, the prices in the UK to go down by nearly 15 quid. We went back to 160 on the life, simply because the expectations were great for Brazil and the US to uh, produce a, a very large uh, uh, volume. But what happened in, 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 in April, Brazil had a crop failure with zero rain over the corn. And we, I will detail all that in the presentation, which has led to at least 20 million tons uh, 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 15 to 20 million tons less corn crop, which is, of course, a, a major a, a major issue for the world markets. And, and also, uh, at the very beginning of April, the USDA has released what they call the planting intention in, in the US. And here, the expectations of the market were absolutely huge because prices were so high. The expectation were, was for, for US farmers to plant a record acreage of corn and soya. And the market has really been, been disappointed where we were expecting 95, 96 million acres to be planted in the US. We only had at least the first report, 92 million acres. So three to four million acres less than what was expected to replenish once again, or to try to stabilize the very low stock. So as a result, the market went up nearly $40, $50. And then, in May, what happened, May is really the start of the, of the planting season in the US where the, the expectations were great. And we had a very cold, a bit like we had in Europe, we had a very cold and dry weather in the US, which has led to a sl very slow start for the plantings in the US, where once again, we were expecting a record crop. So the market priced, once again, a, a higher risk for disappointing crop in the US, which would be a disaster, of course, for the world stocks. And uh, markets changed and uh, farmers uh, in the US uh, managed and in Europe too. I mean, the, 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 the climate changed, changed also. And farmers uh, in the US managed to catch up very strongly with their drillings with a more uh, 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 favorable weather, at least for, for, for drilling. So drier, warmer, but the problem, so the markets collapse as we've seen before, started to collapse because it considered Demand, de uh, demand rationing was not needed anymore. So we're talking about a $50 per ton market collapse in just two or three weeks. 
And since then, since about mid, uh, mid May uh, or, or end of May, the market uh, has climbed very strongly again on weather concern because this dry and warmer weather in the US continued throughout June, which of course, and we're talking about 37, 38 degrees on very recently planted soya and corn and wheat. Uh, so that has uh, added a, again a risk premium for a, a potential crop failure in the US. And we are now at a stage, so we are not at a critical stage in the US, but we are now at, at a stage where uh, we will so soon enter into the July period. And the July period is very critical for corn and soya and for wheat too. And if the weather is good, we could clearly see prices uh, 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 consolidate. I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't say very strongly, but they could consolidate, consolidate by 10, 15%. But if on the contrary, we have a crop failure in the US, I would say sky will be the limit. I mean, we will go back to rationing levels and in terms of UK prices, we're talking about prices above 200 pounds again for next crop. So everything is going to, 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 to all the trend for next year is really going to be uh, uh, defined in the next six weeks weather in the US. It's not the only thing, but it's a major thing. Here I've added also the volatility on Matif rapeseed and life wheat. So on the past three months uh, or four months, 31 quid on, on, uh, on, on life, 125 euros on Matif uh, rapeseed. So this has huge volatility. But what is interesting, if you look at the shape of these of these uh, uh, um, graphs, and if you compare them to the corn shape in the US, you will see that the correlation between what's happening in the US and the corn prices, and you could do the same with the soya, has a nearly 100% impact on what uh, our prices look like in England or in Europe, exactly the same shape of curve. So now, as I said, uh, prices go up to uh, Russian demand. So now let's take a look at if uh, demand has been Russian or has been destroyed by the current uh, new uh, price structure. So the answer is yes, uh, the, the market has, has done its job on the, on the fee sector, because this is, if you look at these prices, these are physical fob prices, Normally, historically, the wheat trades 50 to $70 above corn. This is its natural level. And since we've, since we've had this problem in Brazil, well, low stocks plus problems in Brazil plus risk in the US, as you can see today, the, 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 the corn is now uh, trading at 30 to $40 above uh, uh, um, wheat prices. I'm talking about the physical market here. And this happened in China, in Europe, in the US, everywhere. So the feed compounders, what they do is they, they now are favoring feed barley uh, uh, and feed wheat to corn because uh, the prices is uh, um, indicating them that it's, 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 it's more uh, profitable for them. But now if we look, so yes, the feed complex is, is doing its job with, of course, a certain impact on the wheat. That's why wheat is so correlated to corn. But if we look now at the crush margins, so these are the odd seeds, or most importantly at the biofuels uh, 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 margins, uh, the, we, we, we consider or we can very easily uh, uh, see here on these graphs that the demand rationing has not happened. It's even the opposite. So on this left graph, this is the ethanol price in the US. The ethanol, uh, uh, just for your information, accounts for 40% of the domestic corn consumption in the US. So it's huge. Nearly, nearly half of the corn in the US is used for biofuels. And a large portion of the soya bean oil is also used for biofuels. So as of today, uh, not only you can see that uh, the ethanol prices went up nearly 80% over uh, the past year, so it went up even stronger than the corn price itself, which means the margins, the, 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 the ethanol margins are even stronger now than when uh, the corn price was at only 300, uh, uh, 300 uh, cents per, or let, let's call it $160 per tonne 
when not, now, that, now that it is trading at $300 per ton, the, 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 the ethanol demand is even stronger, which leads uh, to uh, uh, which which should lead to, uh, to 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 some action. So the, the the corn prices should increase more than the ethanol to ration the demand. So the ration is not happening uh, on on the biofuel sector. And same thing, same story for the crush. The reason why crushers still can uh, buy your 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 rapeseed at 430, 450 quid per ton, even 500 on the on on, on the old crop is because. The soya oil or the rapeseed oil markets went up to the roof at the same pace as uh, 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 the, the, the seed uh, prices. So crush are still crush margins are still very profitable. So demand rationing is absolutely not happening. But now, and this is absolutely the very very latest news, and this is explaining why the market has collapsed by nearly uh, ten percent over the past two days. Uh, there has been, I mean, one major risk we were uh, uh, foreseeing in the past few uh, months is, was uh, uh, that given the very, the great tightness of our corn and soya stocks, etc., uh, that the only way to immediately adjust uh, the, the demand pressure would be to, uh, for the governments to lower the compulsory uh, 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 incorporation, incorporation rate in biofuels. So Brazil acted first. They've lowered from 13 to 10 percent their compulsory incorporation rate for biofuels, and this has led to a nearly 1.2 million tons of uh, less soybean demand uh, for, for oil. And but that didn't have a great impact because it's only Brazil. But uh, last Friday in the afternoon, the, the, the Biden administration communi communi communicated on the fact that they could do the same in the US. So lower or give a bit of relief to the refiners uh, 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 because uh, today refiners, when they need to inc incorporate biofuels, they are losing money. And very simply, you can see here that the ethanol price went up year to date 73% and the, the crude oil went up only 40%. So when you need to incorporate the ethanol, it costs you too much money and refiners today cannot make money. So we'll see what happens. There are only talks now, but what's for sure, and here you've got the soybean oil. So the oil is very important for our rapeseed prices. But if we were looking at the, at the corn markets too, they went down nearly 10% 10, 10 in just two days, simply because there is today a risk of lower demand for biofuel. So this is a major risk. I'm not saying it's going to happen. We'll have to follow that because I think Biden is very much committed into, uh, uh, into uh, em environmental issues, much more than Trump. So he has committed himself to be environmental friendly. He's not a good friend of uh, like, like Trump was uh, with fossil energies, etc. So there is a possibility that, uh, that nothing happens, but the market is pricing it very strongly. So this is really news. But we will see later in the presentation that the most important thing is where the market in the US at the moment. So before we move to the to, to, to come back to the world markets, let's focus a little bit on, on what's happening in the UK. So for the, the past four or five years, currency was a major focus for us, not only because world volatility was very low, but also because the, the euro sterling was uh, as great as it has ever been with uh, 10, sometimes 10% sometimes volatility in just a few uh, weeks and months, with, uh, of course, a, a direct corre correlation for, 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 for your UK prices. The good news is, is that since we, uh, the Brexit was done, so the, the, the bad news is that, the, the, as anticipated, the, the sterling went up, which is negative for our prices, but it has stabilized now at a 0 0.85, 87 level, which means that, at the moment, we consider it as pretty neutral. It, it should stay st stable for the coming at least months. So we consider uh, uh, um, uh, currency uh, uh, as pretty neutral for our strategies. And it's a good news because it's very difficult to, of course, to, 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 to predict uh, currency movements. So we can now focus much more on our fundamentals than on the currency. So let's forget about the currency for the moment. It's neutral. The other good news for UK farmers is, uh, well, you've had another very, very difficult year with very wet winter and autumn, very dry 
March and April. And, um, and, and I think the rainfall really came at the right moment. It came, uh, May was a, was, a, was a very, very uh, uh, friendly weather for, 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 for UK yields. And the good news is, is that, that the, 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 the weather has warmed up. And, and, and the, the even better news is that normally by the end of the week, you should receive, I don't know, 20 to 40 millimeters, which I think was quite needed. So normally, I don't know if it's the case for all the listeners, but uh, you should have now secured uh, quite, uh, quite safely most of your yields. And quite a few farmers are even reporting uh, uh, record yields uh, uh, pot uh, possible. 11 tons per hectare uh, on the farms. So good news, which means that normally at this stage of the year, you should be able to take action for the new crop to, uh, uh, to take, uh, to take um, profit of the very, very, very nice prices currently. Sebastian, just quickly, just had a question. Yeah. Um, just because it leads on quite nicely to this, I think. Mm -hmm. um, does ODA have a precise idea of UK wheat crop production for the new crop and how this level of production may affect our prices. Okay, yeah, I will, I will, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will answer that right now, uh, Rachel. Thank you for the question. So yes, indeed, we we do have a view. Of course, we are not, uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do work on that. We 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 engage twice a year uh, crop surveys within our clients. So we did a first crop survey in in uh, back in December, where the expectations was uh, the global expectation was. I would say a range between 13.5 and 14 million tons production for the UK. Uh, we've we've had another um, uh, survey in uh, in March, which has led to increase a little bit our 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 range to 14, 14 and a half million tons. And I would say now now that really conditions have improved so strongly since the end of April, uh, we cannot. Uh, uh, we cannot avoid uh, the, 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 the possibility, not for a record crop, but uh, I would say 15 million tons is now possible. I know many farmers have had issues. Uh, not everything is drilled, late drillings have suffered more, et cetera. So it's not, a, it's not a perfect year, but between 14 and 15 million tons is now very likely. And we could have even a better surprise on the upside. But this has uh, indeed also a very, uh, very uh, a great influence on on your prices. So even if it's the world market that really sets our prices at the moment, there are some UK fundamentals that also influence our markets. So I'm conscious about time, so I'm not going to detail all this S and D. It was just to show that we are between 14 and 15 million tons, and if we do reach 15 million tons, we will have a surplus to export. Okay. And this is uh, the important thing about, about uh, this, this production figure, because it does impact uh, uh, the, the uh, UK price. Uh, here, this graph is showing you the difference between life and Matif, okay? So normally, naturally, life being a feed wheat price and also the UK being naturally an exporter, uh, naturally, uh, life trades about 15 quid below Matif, and this is very simp simple, it, it needs to trade at this level to gain some market share to be able to be, uh, to, to, to be priced into the export market, because you need to add to that the transport cost, the fobbing cost, and then taking it to France, to Spain, or wherever. So if you need to export, the natural level for, for, for life prices and, and, and for your ex farm prices is about 15 quid below Matif. But as you can see here, when you have started to have your drilling issues in the UK, very quickly the market climbs, climbs nearly to parity with Matif because it considered that the UK didn't need to export because. We were expecting maybe 13 or 14 million tons, so a very low crop this year with no surplus to export. So in that case, we, we come to what we call an import parity. So if, if, if the UK needs to import, we are at plus five, plus 10 at the moment. And since we've had better rains and better yield prospects, as you can see, the spread is going down, maybe back to fi minus 15 euro, uh, pounds, sorry. So we are now more or less at minus nine, we could go to minus 15 if we have a fantastic crop uh, in, 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 in the UK, 
So I would say there is a, there could be a six quid, six to seven quid negative impact if we have a, 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 a satisfactory crop above 15 million tons in the UK. But once again, we consider that as very neutral when compared to the huge um, world price volatility. So a bit like currency, we consider this, this spread between the UK market and the rest of the world as pretty negligible because we are talking only about six quid when uh, the market moves nearly three, four quids every day at the moment. Quick word about uh, um, uh, barley. So barley, uh, we've had a very, uh, a very uh, old season last year simply because of Brexit and, 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 and the risk not to have access to European export markets. So most of the year until December, we traded at minus 40, minus 50 quid to feed wheat. And since, since then, the market has reacted strongly, not only because we gained again uh, the access to the European market, but most importantly, if you see on this graph, uh, the, the, the demand for, all seed for feed barley has been record this year, nearly double uh, the five years average, uh, simply because uh, uh, the feed barley has replaced massively the lack of feed wheat available uh, in the UK market with, uh, with a production below 10 million tons uh, in the UK in 2020. So at the moment for new crop, because I think we are more interested in new crop, the discount for feed barley is about minus 15, in some places minus 10. We consider in ODA and, and looking at history that minus 15, minus 10 is a very uh, uh, decent uh, level for us. It's a selling level. So now it will depend on the, on the wheat price, but minus 15, minus 10 is uh, clearly uh, something uh, farmers should not be uh, spend too much time thinking about. It's a very decent level. Uh, coming back to rapeseed. So yes, rapeseed also are at record level, even for new crops. So um, uh, well, the market has, this size we had done last week. So since then we've lost quite, quite a few pounds. So we, the, the market is trading now more or less at 430 quid. Uh, yesterday, we decided to sell some rapeseed for our farmers. Our farmers have quite massively sold their rapeseed, not only because we consider as uh, the, the rapeseed uh, um, uh, production as, I wouldn't say secure, because we know how complex it is to produce at the moment uh, all seed rape in the UK, but with the rain we had in, rain, in May, plus the rain we, we should have at the, at the end of the week, uh, we, we consider selling uh, a, a few, uh, 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 a big portion, uh, uh, less than 50% of course, but of the OC rate is possible. So we sold some, but here again, what is important to understand is it is really the oil market, the vegetable oil market that has led to this massive uh, price increase on, 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 uh, on OC rate. Uh, because we, we are at historical high levels, never, never reached levels, both on our seed rate, but especially on the vegetable oil market. So I don't have a lot of time to develop the veg oil market, uh, why the veg oil market is going up. But what I can say here is it should remain high for at least a, a, a few months. So now let's move to the stock levels, which is really the important story. I mean, why the markets for the last eight months or 10 months have been going up. It's because of stock levels and not because only corn stock levels are low, but because all the stock levels went down, but especially corn and soya beans. And when you get to, to a situation where stocks are going too low, as I said, prices have to climb to try to ration or destroy some of the demand. So let's have a look at the stock levels. Starting with corn, so as you can see, this is this year, all crop, we were at 10% stock to use ratio, which is historically a very low level. Just once in history, we've, we went below 10%, that was in 2012 and 13. And if you remember well, prices went to the roof. And we have now the very first projections released by the USDA for next crop. So they released a 10.6% stock to use ratio which is historically still very low. So no need to tell you that prices will not collapse from one day to another to very low levels with this uh, level of stock to use ratio. But now the question is, are they right to consider that 10.6 is possible next year? 
uh, uh, our view is that it's far too early and it's far too optimistic at this stage. Two reasons, two main reasons for that. First of all, uh, uh, the Brazilian crop was very overestimated by the USDA. When they did this, this figure, they were at uh, 102 million tons. Uh, and we in ODA, we are working on 90 million tons. So we, we estimate that they have roughly 10 million tons of estimation on the Brazilian corn. And most importantly, uh, for the US, they took projections with record yields. And all the latest uh, market developments show us that at, the, the, at least the US crop is going to be average. But we could also be heading to uh, a, a crop disaster still, depending on the weather. So for us, this, uh, this uh, stock to use ratio is at this stage very optimistic. So there are still possibilities for these stocks to move even lower than last year. So I can just let you imagine where the prices would be. But in case everything goes on well uh, uh, in the US, prices will uh, certainly uh, uh, go uh, uh, go down or co uh, consolidate slightly because at this level the market consider uh, 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 the, the the stock to use ratio to be pretty balanced and once again the market will start focusing on Brazil and Argentinian crop that will be drilled very soon in September and all the farmers we spoke to, we, we are speaking to are all intending to uh, uh, drill a, a, a record acreage because prices are so high, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite likely that Brazil and Argentina next year or in six months time will harvest a bumper crop that will rebalance everything. So stock levels uh, for soya, sorry. So stock levels for soya are also on the knees as low as, as they've ever been. Uh, here, clearly we have very little hope or, or, or scenarios where the stock levels will increase. Uh, the only risk, once again, is maybe the biofuel sector, but it, it will still be very negligible when compared to the size of the Chinese demand. We've, we've overpassed this year for the first time 100 million tons of imports. So it's very clear uh, China, Ch Chinese are just buying whatever is available on the Brazilian or uh, the US markets. So not a lot of hope for, for the soybean stocks to go up and for the prices to go down. And as you can see, uh, uh, the wheat uh, stock to ratio is very stable. 24% stock to ratio, very, very comfortable. Uh, so no, no major story on the wheat, even if wheat demand should increase a little bit because of uh, the switch between corn and wheat. Uh, uh, the, the, the supply side is clearly uh, on, on, on the upside. And I will summarize it here. But... Uh, no major things to, to declare, except that European Union is indeed going to do much better than last year. Australia, which, who had a very bumper crop last year, should still have a very good crop. Argentina should do better. Russia will certainly do five million tons less than last year, but still, it's, it will still be the third biggest crop ever. Uh, Ukraine is, is about to do a record crop again this year. And the U.S., given the problems they've had, but the U.S. is not a big player for, 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 for wheat, should have a lower crop than last year. But globally, uh, globally, this is a well-provided market for, for, for wheat. So now let's focus on China, uh, which, is, which was uh, this year uh, a really a, a, a surprising player, unexpected. And, and the real question today is, uh, is China going to be present? Were they present only this year because they've had an issue uh, or are they going to be present now on the longer term? And that's, uh, I think, a major question. So first thing, the, the, the main reason why uh, China uh, became a, a large importer this year, uh, it all started with these big uh, uh, stories, you know, three, four years ago, they, got, they had this ASF uh, 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 fever issue. Um, and the, 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 the Chinese government took the decision to simply prohibit any uh, 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 small units production. So before three, four years ago, let's say 90% of the peak production in, in, in China was done in the backyards of small farmers. Uh, 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 with millions and millions and millions of units, but when they had this fever, of course, they, 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 um, they, um, 
they quickly uh, recognized that it was very hard to control the fever with millions of units. So they simply took a, a decision to prohibit uh, small production units. And they transformed that in just three years in these massive, massive, massive production units uh, who uh, not only are massive, uh, they look like car park. I mean, they, pre they produce millions and millions of pork, each of them. Uh, but also, I mean, these pork that are produced in these units, I'm sure they don't eat the same uh, food as this pork, who, who is a lot of garbage or whatever. These pigs eat proper food. They, they, they eat uh, uh, soya meal, they eat corn, uh, formulas, etc. So, which has led uh, to, to, to a very strong uh, uh, demand increase, especially for corn and for soya. <coughs> Sorry. And at the same time, uh, last year, uh, in 2020, China has had a, a kind of crop failure. They've had three typhoons during the months of March and April 2020, which has led also to a lower crop. So more demand, a lower domestic crop, which has led the, the, the Chinese to have to go for the first time in 20 years out in the markets, the corn market, the wheat market, the feed barley market, to buy what they needed. So. Very quickly, uh, this year, the, so if you look at the past 10 years here, for the corn uh, imports, China was a very negligible importer, let's say from one to four, five million tons every year. This year, they imported th more than 30 million tons. So this is a 21 million uh, tons uh, uh, increase, and it has surprised the market. So you could say, you could argue that 20 million tons is nothing when compared I mean, the, the, the total uh, corn production in the world is more than a billion ton. So 21 million ton is nothing. But what you need to understand is what makes the corn price, the wheat price or the soya price is not the global production, is the trade, is the amount of volume that is being traded from one country to another. And out of 1 billion tons of corn produced every year in the world, only about 200 million tons are traded. Only 200 million tons are exported and imported, which means that 21 million tons increase, sudden increase in the market represents 10% of the global trade. So it's huge. So that's why it has impacted so much the markets. Uh, and the real question is, are they going to be present next year? And here you've got part of the answer because they already purchased uh, 12 million tons of US corn for the new crop. And as you can see here, they purchased it much earlier than they did last year. So they are not only buying corn, they are also buying wheat. So here you can see that they bought zero European wheat and, and, and European wheat is just an example because they're doing that in Russia, they're doing that in Argentina, everywhere where, where it's possible. So they were totally absent. That's why we were never taking China into account when uh, 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 analyzing the trade markets, because they, 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 are, they are the biggest producer in the world, they have, they have the biggest stocks in the world, maybe 50% of the stocks is located in China uh, in terms of, of, of wheat stocks, but they were not price influencer because they were not exporting and they were not importing. For the last two years, they started to import some wheat. And, uh, and, and this is, these are big figures, I mean, 1.9 million tons. And this is only French wheat, because France is the only country that is allowed to export uh, wheat to China in Europe. Uh, and as you can see, next year, they already bought 22 Panamaxes that will be sent from July to September, so uh, starting next month, uh, uh, to China. And they will certainly do more uh, in the course of the year. So the answer is yes. Uh, same for barley. They bought 1 million tons of French barley for the new crop. So the answer is yes, China is going to keep on uh, being a major player, at least for this year, and will recon certainly for the coming years. So the main reason why, and that's very illustrative, uh, China uh, uh, manages to buy such volumes in, uh, in, in, in the world market is simply because of prices. I mean, the, the, the blue line here is the Chinese domestic price, okay? So as you can see, it's, it's about 400, sometimes $450 per ton, domestic market. And this is the world market imported into China. So this is including uh, uh, freight cost, etc. 
So as you can see, some, there was a point of time this year where there was a 200, uh, sorry, a 120, 130 dollars difference between uh, the domestic market and the world market. So that's why uh, uh, that allowed, sorry, this all started in September, October, that has allowed the Chinese to import massive quantities. So today, and this is the new crop, uh, new crop price today, uh, even if the spread has narrowed a little bit, but uh, the Chinese uh, corn is still $75 above the world market. So it should allow them to keep on uh, uh, importing large quantities. Just a quick word. I think this is very interesting for, for, for UK farmers or for any farmers. This is how uh, the, 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 the Chinese market works. In fact, China holds, as I said, 50% of the world stocks. And this is the states who hold, hold it. And every week they make an auction. Uh, so they propose three to four million tons to sell to the market. So feed compounders, et cetera. And the, and the market buys sometimes small quantities, sometimes bigger quantities, et cetera. But since the corn problem started in the world, so back in September, October, uh, 2020, you can very easily see that the, 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 the volumes purchased by the markets in China of wheat has uh, surged to uh, triple, multiplied may maybe by 10 to nearly 4 million tons per, per, per year. So this illustrates what I said at the beginning of the pre presentation, that uh, 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 because of price structure, uh, uh, wheat is, and for the last at least three, four months, wheat is replacing uh, at least partially uh, corn in the feed compounders formulas. Okay, so there is a real switch which has led, of course, wheat prices to also climb. That's why wheat is so dependent to the corn market, and that's why what happens in the corn market really influences uh, your, 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 your wheat prices. So now let's take a look at. Uh, uh, the supplies, because I mean, stock levels are, are known, demand levels are more or less known. Now, what will make uh, uh, the prices going up or down is the supply. And the supply, we are now in the middle of, of uh, a, lo a lot of harvest, uh, not harvest, but uh, growing season in most of the, in, in all the northern hemisphere. So, as I said before, we'll see that everything seems to be quite fine in the Black Sea and Europe. The problem is clearly in the Americas, so in South America and in North America. So starting with the most important, which is uh, 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 the US, where here you've got most of the corn soya belt, including uh, the wheat, spring wheat is being drilled here and, and, and winter wheat is being drilled here. So I think what, what is interesting, because I would speak a lot about that, is to compare 2021 so this is what we call drought monitoring. So every year, uh, every, every week, uh, the US published a map of drought monitoring. And if you compare 2021 with 2013, you can see that not only the situation looks similar, but it even looks worse. Uh, 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 and we are talking here only on, about the corn belt. Huh? It looks even worse in 2021. So the 2012 scenario with a big question mark at the end is, possible or even probable, okay? Because they've had, and they're having too dry, too dry weather, and most importantly, very warm too. So that's uh, the weather forecast for the next week. So it's going to be very, very dry for the next four, five days. It looks like uh, they're going to have uh, some rains in the, uh, after the next seven days. So that will be, will start to be very critical. A bit like you in the UK, when you receive your rain, in April, I mean, if they receive some rain and good rains uh, uh, in the next, uh, I would say, two weeks, it could really stabilize what looks like a disaster today. If it doesn't, it will really start to, 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 to significantly impact the yields. So something to be looked at very, very, uh, very, um, very, uh, uh, I mean, on, on a daily basis. So this is uh, when I was talking about the 2012-13 scenario, this is very important. Every week, starting in April, end of April, uh, the USDA published what we call crop uh, notations, crop conditions in, in the US. So it started 
three weeks ago with, as you say, as you can see here on the right, with 76% of the corn being in good to excellent condition. So this is perfect. This is nearly a record in the past 10 years. Uh, but given the circumstances of uh, bad weather, etc., uh, very quickly, the market anticipated that the, the crop notations would, would fall. So last week, uh, the crop notation went, went down to 72%. And yesterday, because the crop notation is published every day, we are now at 65%, okay? So we, what, what, what we can see on this graph is we are following nearly to the letter, uh, the 2012-13, uh, which was a major crop failure in the US trend. So if next week we are to 60%, the market will start to be panicking, I would say, depending of course on the weather forecast, because this is highlighting the past, okay? Uh, the, the, what has happened, what, what is happening in the weather, and this is weather forecast. So if the weather forecasts are good, we might stabilize around 60%, which would still be good. Uh, uh, but if the market, if the crop condition was to fall, uh, 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 we will be facing a, a crop failure in the US and clearly prices will have no other choice than, than, than going up. So here again, what I highlighted in the next six, seven weeks, uh, 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 weather will, will need to be watched for. I mean, if there is one thing as farmers you need to watch for is weather forecast. Um, here, very quickly, because I'm a bit conscious about time, um, very quickly, um, weather in, in Europe has been very favorable, even if it's not perfect. I mean, in Eastern countries, everything looks well, but no one is talking about record uh, yields, so it will be very average, uh, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing amazing to, 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 to our point of view. But crop notation, especially in France, who had a similar disaster as the UK last year, as you can see this year, they are much better than last year. So yes, indeed, crops should, should look much better. Um, in, in Russia, this is the winter crop uh, area. Everything is good. It's warm, it's wet, no problem. But we have an alert at the moment on the spring crop area. Okay, as you can see, it's first of all it's been drilled uh, late, and it's dry and warm. So small alert here: uh, uh, the spring crop in, in uh, the wheat spring crop in, in Russia accounts for forty percent of the production. They produce one point four, one point five tons per hectare in these regions. So if they, if they go down to one point two, one point three, it's a major change. It's twenty percent extra. So a small alert here. But we will see uh, later. Conscious about, about time, so I, I will move very quickly to Brazil. So, without giving too much detail, sadly, but Brazil has had a major crop failure, or is having, because harvest is just starting now. So, as you can see here, uh, when the USDA was, uh, was um, just a month, two months ago, was predicting 109 million tons for, for the Brazilian crop, we are now. Uh, projecting 90 million tons, maybe less. And now I'm going to spend a bit of time explaining you here why is the Brazilian crop so important. Uh, uh, and this graph highlights it very well. So you've got four uh, corn exporters in the world. US is number one, Brazil is number two, Ukraine and Argentina are, let's say, uh, sometimes number three, sometimes number four, uh, depending on the years. So US and Brazil are number one, number two. As you can see on this graph, this is Brazil. From July, when they harvest till December, the world trade relies mainly on Brazilian new, stock, uh, new, new, new supplies are, are arriving on the market. So it's crucial. Now that we have a crop failure clearly identified in Brazil, we will have clearly much more difficulties to fill uh, this gap, especially, uh, especially because the U.S. stocks, all old, uh, old crop stocks are on their knees. They are as low as they can, they can be. Ukraine has had a major crop failure last year. They lost 11 million tons when compared to uh, initial, initial production. And Argentina is going to produce 3 to 4 million tons less than, than, than the past year. So Brazil will be left nearly alone to feed the world from July till the arrival of the other crops, so let's say November, uh, 
and 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 this tightness is going to 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 of course uh, no, in no other way uh, will 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 take prices or will keep prices high and 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 this is what is important here this is uh, to uh, this is uh, very illustrative of how important it is for the ukrainian and the us crop that are being uh, grown at the moment that will ent will be entering in the flowering season in july and august how important it is to be able to as soon as possible take the lead to help brazil feed the world and if they have a crop failure following already very low stock levels and a very low production in brazil i mean prices will have no other choices than going up to once again russian the demand okay so this is not a given, but it's a, a really tangible scenario. So just to sum up a little bit, uh, this is to compare the wheat prices in 2007 and 8 when compared to uh, sorry 7 and 8 when compared to this year. So as we can see, we did uh, uh, reach the rationing levels, demand rationing levels. As we can see, it never stays very long, and this year again uh, again we, we have the proof that looking at the past is uh, allowing us to predict the future because once again when, when, once we've reached the rationing the rationing levels market very quickly starts looking forward at us crop brazilian crops etc etc and start anticipating a uh, stock replenishment and go back to more natural levels so higher levels than than normal but natural levels and above, uh, I would say, Matif above 200 euros or life above 180 quid are not natural levels. They are levels that are historically very high and prices. Uh, normally, if, if, if the crops are, if we don't have any further crop incidence in front of us, normally prices cannot stay very, very, very longer here. So that's why farmers need to be very agile. I know farmers don't like selling when prices is going up. And then when prices go, go down, you start questioning yourself, et cetera. So you should not, absolutely not hesitate to sell when a, a market is, right, is rising. Because just imagine if you sell, if you're a farmer, you sell your wheat here. Okay, you are, you are very disappointed because you didn't catch the highs, but two months later, the market is here and you, you become a happy farmer. So, uh, Catching the highs is nearly impossible. It's like playing the lottery. So if you want to catch the highs, you will certainly catch the lows. Okay, so it's something in terms of risk management to really have in mind. And I think that's why you need a bit of external help to be able to help you to take this decision, which is never an easy decision, of course. Because, uh, so this is a quick summary of uh, what to watch for before harvest starts. So as I said, US Canadian weather is key. Russian spring wheat conditions that are too dry and too warm to be watched for. And the Brazilian final corn harvest results will be known nearly certainly in about three, four weeks, will also uh, be a price mover. So, uh, um, so Chinese demand, as I said, is supposed to, to, to remain very strong. So no major, but this year it won't, it won't come as a surprise. It's already priced by the market, but it should come, keep on supporting our markets. Uh, Big, big uh, question mark about this U U.S. biofuels uh, policy change. So it's only talks now, rumors, etc. We'll see if Biden takes a de decision in favor of the, ref uh, of the crude oil producer or the diesel producer or in favor of the farmers. Uh, uh, normally, given his, his, policy, his political engagement, normally he should be in favor of the environment. But we will see. But this is, will be a big, big price mover. Of course, we keep on uh, looking at uh, stock reports from the USDA released every month. But very important, very important is the 30th of June uh, 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 new accurate uh, report from the US. So 30th of March, they published the planting intention. 30th of June, they will give the real accurate. And the market, and as I said, 92 million tons were the intentions of US farmers. Market is now talking about 96, maybe sometimes 98 million tons. So this, the market is starting to anticipate a much higher acreage uh, drill by US farmers. 
so these are the expectations. If the, the report is lower than that, market will go up. But if it meets the expectation, market could consolidate here also. So just expect great volatility at the end of June and beginning of July. This report will be highly important. And if you need to take some selling decision, it's always good to have a bit of volumes already uh, already secured before this kind of uh, 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 very important uh, 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 data release. Uh, and in the UK, as I said, I, I consider the currency as very neutral, not only because it's very stable, but also very neutral when compared to the world volatility. And the fact that UA, UK is a net exporter, a net, net importer next year, I think is now more or less known. We will be a small exporter. Uh, uh, with, I would say, a four or five quid negative impact maybe on our prices, uh, but which is, once again, negligible when compared to, to, to the rest of, of, uh, of, uh, of the world volatility. So that's more or less it. I just wanted to, to highlight here, but I think we, we, we won't have a lot of time, but these are the kind of strategies we have, I would say, for expert farmers in the, in, in the UK. So as you can see, the, the blue lines, the blue dots, sorry, the squares, are when we, we sold some wheat for the new crop. So as you, you can see, we, we started selling quite early and at low levels, but at the same moment, we took some call options on the corn market because we knew the corn. We detected very early that the corn market was going to be the market leader in the world. So this has allowed us to have an average price today with today's prices above 180 quid, simply because what we sold in, in, in the physical market in the UK, we re-exposed it uh, uh, on the corn market because we, we had great expectation for the corn market. So, which, which means that even if you fix your price, in fact, we fixed before Brexit because we had no clue if we were going to have a hard Brexit or not a hard Brexit. So we consider it as a major risk. Uh, so we did sell quite, quite a lot of, of wheat before the 31st of December, but we re-exposed it to the world market because we had a very bullish view. So that was just to give a, an example. So that's, that's about it um, for me. Uh, so we can start. I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm, I'm a bit, maybe 10 minutes too no. long. Sebastian, that was, well, it was a really, really interesting insight into the grain markets yeah. and just how global um, events can impact on the UK market. So I know it's a massive topic and subject which you could go on talking about, but that really was very interesting. So thank you very much. Um, I do have time, we are over time, but I have, I'll ask one quick question. Mm. Um, looking longer term, how do you think the changes we are seeing with climate change will affect grain prices going forward? Uh, oh, the problem is I can speak 20 minutes on that. I'm not going to speak about climate change because, well, Yes, indeed, we see more and more and more uh, 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 climate issues. That's for sure. We've had La Nina this year. I mean, everywhere. I mean, just look at the UK. I mean, you, you, you sometimes. I mean, sometimes you've got the. You are the driest country last year and this year uh, during spring in all Europe. I mean, the UK, the reigning country. So yeah, there are problems. You, you've had two consecutive years, etc. So only in the UK, you already feel there is something happening. So yes, indeed, uh, uh, it means that the supply is the supply side of our, 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 our markets is going to be more volatile than ever. But I think the most important thing is not that is 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 why is it going to be problematic? It's simply because the demand side of our market is going up on a straight line for the last thirty years, two to four percent every year. We're talking about for the corn; it's nearly ten to 10, 10 to twenty million tons per year more demand and in a way another we need to find supplies to feed that so very quickly but so this this demand has been supplied thanks to a big increase in the black sea of acreage and yields big uh, uh, increase in brazil and and argentina so they deforested one third of the amazonian etc to produce soya uh, uh, and and very soon these countries will also be capped in terms of yields and in terms of acreage, ex except if they just deforest all the Amazonian. So there will be a point where that will not be enough. Brazil in the last 20 years has tripled their, their production to feed China and the rest of the world, but mainly to feed China. And the interesting thing about that is 
for, uh, for Brazilian farmers to be able to uh, uh, produce corn and wheat at 3,000 kilometers from the ports uh, with nearly, <coughs> nearly $100 transport cost, logistical cost to go to the, to, to, to the port. So nearly one third of their production uh, of, of their corn uh, price is used for, uh, for, for logistics. To, al to allow them to produce that, you need prices to be very high, okay? So that's why in terms of long-term prices, and you can see that very well on, in this graph, when the prices were very low, uh, very, sorry, uh, uh, when the market was very balanced, you can see that the market prices was about 200 cents per bushel in the US. 10 years later, when the demand, Chinese demand has increased so much, when the market is balanced, we are nearly at a double level. So next step, of this, I would say, this tear is once we will come out from this volatile period and the market re will re become balanced, we should normally be a step higher than what we were before, simply because you need prices to increase to be able to uh, find new supply uh, areas. And my, my guess, and uh, my guess is that in the next 10, 20 years, if population keeps on growing like it does, and demand keeps going like it does, Africa will be the next continent because Africa has a very good weather, very good land, but the problem, they don't have any infrastructure. So if we want Africa to become the next supplier of Chinese demand, etc., we will need to deforest, we will need to uh, uh, um, create port facilities, railway facilities, storage facilities. We are talking about hundreds of billions of investment and if you want investors to invest hundreds of billions of dollars, you need corn, soya, wheat prices to be higher. Same for crude oil. Crude oil, if, if suddenly we have a, a, a shortage of crude oil in the world in the next 30 years, crude oil prices will climb to $200. And it will allow uh, the Brazilian, for example, to uh, pick up massive volumes that are very expensive to look for because they are very deep in the sea. So if prices go up, it allows new supplies to appear. Sorry for this long, uh, long answer, but no, uh, no, I, I, it's a lot. It's a lot for you to talk about. I know, but thank, we are completely out of time, so I really am going to have to stop it. But thank you so, so much for your time. Okay. Um, it really, really has been good. And um, if you have any further questions to anyone watching, please do um, either contact yeah, you Sebastian can. directly or um, your regional office or any of the events team via the email address um, that you will have all received when you receive the link for this. Um, but really, I hope you've enjoyed today's session and um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you ever so much. Thank you and thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.